again. Good morning. It's good to see familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. It's good to see everyone here. It is a privilege to worship the Lord together. Um, last week, Pastor Vic shared, he actually explained what is true worship. And I feel like that is always our goal every, every time when we meet God is to tr have true worship. He explained that true worship happens when our mind fully understand. I hope I'm saying this right, Pastor Vic. It's a test. So uh, when our mind fully understand, rightfully understand who God is and our hearts respond to this knowledge. So that is our prayer today that each of us, we know that we serve the creator who gave us the breath of life. And with that, we respond by our hearts, our minds, our words, our singing, even in our listening today, we are responding that we acknowledge that he is that king that we celebrate today. For our call to worship, please uh, respond in the bold. Our call to worship, we gather to worship the Lord Almighty in spirit and in truth. We gather to worship a holy and sovereign God who loves us even when we are corrupt and sinful. And that is indeed what we desire today, for God's presence to fill us today. Let's declare that as we invite the Holy Spirit to overwhelm us with his presence today. Let's all stand. Let this be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can come. Please. 
hardship, of heartbreak, but when we meet together, when we are in God's presence, He renews us, He refreshes us. Our troubles may seem huge, overwhelming, but God is so much infinitely bigger than our problems. God has already overcome the world. Sorrows deep I call when my hope is shaken, torn and ruined from the fall. Hear my desperation, for so long I pled and prayed. God, come to my rescue. And so the thorn remains, still my heart will praise you. Oh my soul, storms, oh sorry, storms within. Storms within my troubled soul, questions without answers. On my faith these billows roll. God be now my shelter, why are you cast down my soul, hope in him who saves you, when the fires have all grown cold, cause this heart to praise you. Should my life 
life be torn from me. Every worldly pleasure, when all I possess is grief, God be then my treasure. Be my vision in the night, be my hope and refuge, till my faith is turned to sight. Lord, my heart will praise you. Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. My help, my rock, I will praise Him. Sing, oh, sing through the rain. Storm, you're still my God, my salvation. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, put your hope in God, my help, my rock. I will praise Him. Sing. salvation and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise and so will rest in your embrace for I the waters you great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine Grace abounds in deep as waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine Spirit leave me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you may call me 
take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me when my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you Take me deeper than my feet could ever want, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior, and I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine amen let's all be seated we have um been on the book of Exodus in the past few weeks, and the book reminds me as we study the lives of the Israelites as they exited out of Egypt that they've made quite a bit of mistakes, and it's mistakes that we still see today. So thousands of years have not changed human nature. In our time of renewal, In our time of renewal, um, you can check your bulletin. Uh, it, Holy God, like the people in the wilderness, we create for ourselves idols and worship them, only to discover their shallowness and emptiness in our lives. Stop us in our tracks, O oh Lord. Help us to be, be open to your, your will, will for, for our lives. lives. Give, Give us the persistence and the courage to do your will. Heal us from our wayward actions and attitudes. Remind us that we must reach out to others in compassion and peace. Merciful God, help us again to be your disciples, offering hope and peace to your hurting and wounded world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's Continue to be in an attitude of prayer as we silently pray to our God. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, thy will be, be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our words of grace are from Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Training, training us, us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and, and to live self-controlled, self upright, and godly lives, lives in this present age. Uh, we now invite our heavenly choir to come and uh, bless us uh, with the song and then we'll invite Pastor Vic to come and present our new members.
worthy. God is worthy of all of this. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship this morning. He is worthy of us coming together to remind each other of Him. That's what the local body of Christ does. There is a global body, as it were. There is a global body of Christ, a capital C church. But here at 7600 Number 4 Road, there is also a local body of Christ. This morning, we are so glad to receive it as our members more than 20 people who have decided to be part of this local family of God. There are so many, so we're just going to read out the names. And as I read out your names, what will happen is that um, the certificates will be presented to you as you walk past. Um, and then, you know, you will fill, you know, the, the, the stair from here to there. And we might need to use the second stair if there's not enough space. This morning, we welcome Moses, Moises Batarina, Francis Cham, Jared Cham, Josh Cham, Lisa Cheng, Ling Chua, Enrico Chua, Heidi D, Emma Familoni, Mark Hayward, Margaret Hu, Chris Hui, Yvette Hui, Chloe McDonald, Dylan McDonald, Jean Ong, Ashley Sison, Lisa Skippen, Earl Ui, Rachel Ui, James Cheng, Jillian, sorry, James Villafuerte, Jillian Villafuerte, Myla Villafuerte, Evelyn Villanueva, Winnie Ip. And we also welcome back Jacob Ang, Karen Ang, Alvin Yang, and Nicole Yang with grateful hearts. We welcome everyone. Can we give them a round of applause? Let's pray for them, all right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these who have been called to be part of the local family of God here at Emmanuel CRC. We thank you for each life that is here. We thank you for the families and the generations that are represented in and through them. We ask, O oh God, that you help us as a community to be there for one another, primarily to worship you and to respond to you in, for all that you have done, but also to encourage one another, to run alongside one another, to be there for one another as we go through thick and thin, as we go through life itself. I ask, O oh God, that you use us as a church to minister to our community. Lord, that we would be able to reach out and impact the community in which you have placed us. Lord, we covenant to stand alongside one another as we worship you and as we witness to the world that you've placed us in. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. one expanding church family and we are excited to see how the lord continues to work through icrc so in the next uh two minutes let's all stand let's uh congratulate the, our new members and for those new fam old new familiar faces let's get a chance to uh, keep get say hi to people in the next two minutes Welcome.
हाँ Okay, two minutes is actually up. Actually, two and a half minutes is already up. Uh, while we make our way to our seats, children, you can also make your way to Sunday school. In our time of Thanksgiving, in our time of Thanksgiving, um, I'm reading from an excerpt from Psalm 104, who it describes God's generosity to us and how he has provided for us. He makes spring, springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food, our food, from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. Um, the passage just reminds me that God, in his infinite wisdom, even before we know our needs, he has already provided for all of those. Um, God opens his hand and we are filled with all good things. So let's come before the Lord in an attitude of thanksgiving as we come before him in prayer. Father, you are our shepherd. And because of this, we've never lacked for anything. You recognize our needs even before we know of them. What a privilege to be able to call you our creator, our father, our shepherd, and our constant provider. Thank you for looking out for us. Even when at times we are not thinking of you, we have cast you aside, we are truly amazed, Lord, by your faithfulness. And we are so grateful that you are faithful. You are the source of all our blessings, and we desire to bless you today with our tithes and our offerings. We pray, Lord, that you will use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we call on Nathan for our scripture reading, Exodus chapter 33. Good morning. Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and I have you, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, and I have your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, and I, your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Nathan, for reading scripture for us this morning. We're in the third and last section of Exodus, chapters 25 to 40. 
This section talks mainly about the presence of God. God gives detailed instructions to Moses for the construction of a tabernacle. It's not a container to limit God, but a conduit of God's presence designed to radiate outwards through the tribes and camped around the tabernacle so that the presence of God reaches the entire world. But here we are. Presence is interrupted in chapters 32 to 34. We're, we're right here in the middle. In the messy middle, just as God is instructing Moses, something happens. The people of God who experience God's redemption, the same people who experience God taking them out of Egypt, this same people are now beginning to worship a golden calf. And just as God is doing a new thing, because not since Eden has the presence of God dwelt with humanity, God is about to do a new thing, just as God is about to do a new thing, sin interrupts. And we see the corruption within, and it isn't pretty. The curious thing, though, is that the theme of presence renews. So, so presence, idolatry, presence. That's the curious thing. Why does presence resume? Shouldn't it simply end? Shouldn't God simply call, call to account Israel and put an end to this whole journey? Why resume? How is that possible after what Israel has done? Israel has worshipped another God. One of the first commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. Israel worships another God. Is it possible for presence to resume? Is it possible for the people of God to find true rest amidst brokenness? This week we will examine Exodus chapter 33 and find how it is that the people of God can find true rest. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this morning. Our hearts reverberate with a song, He is worthy. He is worthy. You, O oh God, are worthy. You are worthy of praise. You who called us and redeemed us. You who desired relationship with us in covenant. You who let your presence dwell with us, amongst us. We give you thanks. You are worthy. We ask, O oh God, that even as we meditate upon your word this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. Be glorified this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 3, God tells Moses, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. God says to Moses, go, go from here. Take the people that you have brought out of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. To your, I swore this, I swore to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, but I will not go with you. Redemption, check. God has saved Israel out of Egypt. Covenant, check. God has established covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and He will see through that covenant. Israel will be situated in the land flowing with milk and honey. God will establish the people of Israel in the promised land. Presence? Presence? Well, here in verse 3, we wonder. What about the instructions for the tabernacle? Wasn't God preparing Israel so that the nation would host the holy presence of God? Wasn't God preparing Israel to be that channel of blessing to the nations? God would be present with and for Israel and through Israel impact the nations around. Wasn't that the plan? But God says here, I will not go up among you. In the previous chapter, for those of us who are just joining us this week and, and you weren't here last week, in the previous chapter, Moses comes down from the mountain. He sees Israel in the midst of idolatry, worshipping the golden calf. He intercedes for them, but he also puts a stop to, uh, to the idolatry. As a judge and as a prophet, he calls to account the calf. He calls to account Aaron. He calls to account the people. The calf was pulverized. It was scattered in water. The people made to drink it. Moses rebuked Aaron for leading the people into sin. And those who were instrumental in the worship of the golden calf, they were killed. Following God, 
is a matter of life and death. It is serious business. And placing anything else at the center, worshipping anything else other than the one true God, has deadly consequences. Not only is there judgment, but God says the words that Moses and Israel dread to hear, I will not go up among them. God will send an angel to go before, but he will not dwell with them. God's power will still be present. God will use his power to establish Israel in the promised land, just as he said he would. God's power would go with them, but God's presence would not. When the people of Israel heard this disastrous word, they mourned. No one put on their ornaments. The people mourned. Life would not carry on as it was. They would put aside all ornamentation, all decoration. They would probably put on sackcloth, very uncomfortable clothes, and they would mourn before the Lord. They understood the seriousness of the matter. Life wouldn't continue as usual. You see, for Israel, it was God's active presence that intervened in Egypt. It's God's active presence that saved them from slavery. God's active presence that split open the sea so that Israel could escape from the pursuing army of Egypt. God's active presence led them through the wilderness, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. That was God's presence guiding them through treacherous terrain. For a people of God that has been so redeemed by God in such a way, for a people of God who have been called into relationship, covenantal relationship with God, the absence of God is disaster, absolute disaster. For a people redeemed, even if God's, people, God's power would go before them, even if God's power would chase out the inhabitants of Uh, the promised land before them. It was God's presence that they would miss and they mourned deeply. This is a right response to the word that comes from God. Repentance starts with mourning. Mourning the loss of presence. I want to say a little bit about the loss of God's power and the loss of God's presence in our lives, all right? There's a difference. And the key difference is that of Result and relationship. Some of us are results focused, right? That as long as we get to the promised land, it'll be okay. As long as God's power goes before us, that'll be okay, right? But let's go back to first principles. Why are we going to the promised land in the first place? Why are the people of God called to the promised land? Why were they, why were they brought out of Egypt in the first place? If results were so important, if, if being, let's say, having housing and employment is so important, then perhaps Israel could have stayed in Egypt. They had jobs. It wasn't great. Uh, They were being oppressed as slaves. They had jobs. They had homes. They made, I mean, if results were so important, all they had to do was simply make more bricks, satisfy the Pharaoh. Hmm? They'll be okay. Improve their relationship with Pharaoh. But the first principle is that we are made for relationship with God. We are made to worship God. We're not only made to work. We're not only made to get a result. We are made for relationship. We were made in God's own image to be in relationship to Him, to image, to represent God to one another. We were made to worship and to work. And our our worship is that relationship with God and our work is to help and to serve God one another, not to impose our wills on each other so as to achieve some desired result. Because relationship is the desired result. Relationship is the desired result. Now, I'm going to pause here and say, if you're experiencing some kind of brokenness in relationship, whether vertically with God, or horizontal with people that God has placed around you, if you're experiencing some kind of brokenness in relationship, could it be that you've been focusing a bit too much on results? Could it be? If so, mourning is an appropriate way to resume relationship. Mourning is an expression that all is not well 
Mourning is an expression that life cannot continue as things, uh, as it has been going. We put an end to that. We begin by mourning. Moses begins to intercede for Israel. As Israel mourns this disastrous word that comes from God, Moses begins to intercede for Israel. Now therefore, if I have found favour in your sight, please show me your ways that I might know you in order to find favour in your sight. Consider too, this nation is your people. Show me your ways. He did not say, show me the way to the promised land. That would be result. He said, show me your ways. Show me how I am to think. Show me how I am to feel. Show me how I am to walk, how I am to talk. How will I live daily life? Show me, God, your ways. How can I live life to please you? How can I be in relationship with you. This begins Moses' intercession. Lord, show me your ways. We want to live lives that please you. We want, to, we want your presence much more than your power. But in order for your presence to be with us, we need to live the way that you've called us to live. Show me your ways. God says to Moses, actually, in uh, 33, chapter 33, verse 1, He says, to Moses, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. Moses, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. Okay? And Moses in his intercession here says, Lord, this nation is your people, O oh God. Yours, not mine. I did not bring them out of Egypt. Lord, you did. Please think of this nation as your people. Together, we want to learn how to be in relationship with you. This is full intercession. He identifies with the people of Israel. It's not, you know, these are another group, you know, God, you can deal with them as you see fit. He identifies with Israel as an us. Even if God is not displeased with him directly, God is displeased with the nation of Israel. He identifies with Israel. He says, Lord, help us to know your ways. Consider this nation as yours. And, in, and there's a back and forth as this intercession goes on between God and Israel. God says, my presence will go with you, I will give you rest. And Moses says to God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Alright, so in the first section, you see the ESV. In the second section, this is just a literal translation. Alright, I will not bore you with the Hebrew itself. Um, but you see, this is important because the word you, there are two, two, two important things about this. That's why I did it in the literal. The word you in English can mean singular or plural, right? If I, if I say, you know, you all listen, you know, it could be meaning, or if I say you listen, it could be meaning all of you listen, or it could be meaning, you know, just one of you listen. It's just you, right? But in the Hebrew, it, it is very specific. If it's singular or it's plural, and here, God says to Moses, my presence will go. There is no with you here. This is an interpolated word. It, you know, basically, they, they, uh, the, the translators have to find something to put there. My, otherwise, it will just sound like my presence will go and I will give you rest. All right? But in, this, in the second line, God, gives, God will give Moses rest. God will not... He's, saying, I will, he's not saying I will give you Israel rest. He's saying, I will go and I will give you, Moses, rest. God will go with a single person. God will give a single person rest. And depending on which version you read, you could come to very different conclusions. So if you see the NIV, some of you have the NIV for verse, uh, verses 14 and 15. And in the NIV it says, uh, if your presence does not go with us. In the ESV it says, with me. Right? In the NASB it says, with me, but the words are in italics. They're in italics because, uh, at least for the NASB, whenever they, they, they find that they need to add a word to make the translation smooth, um, it's in italics. Okay? Whereas the ESV will put, you know, uh, with you, 
uh, with me, sorry, and then the NIV will put with us. I actually prefer the NIV here. I prefer the NIV because it says, it actually just says in Hebrew, if your presence will not be going, so this is a verb that doesn't need a subject, it doesn't need a, a plural or a singular subject, it doesn't need a subject at all. If your presence will not be going, do not bring us up from here. All right? So Moses is praying as an us, and I believe that that us applies both to the first phrase and to the second phrase. So I think the best translation would be, if your presence will not be going with us, do not bring us up from here. God will go. So this is a conversation where God is saying, I will go with you, Moses. Moses, I will give you rest. But, God, but Moses is saying to God, I don't just want that. That is great, but I don't just want that. God, please go with us. God, please go with all of Israel. Moses is interceding for Israel in this two verses. He's standing in the gap for them. And he's saying, God, if you don't go with us, we don't want to leave this place. Now, mind you, land was very important in that day. It's probably also important today. But, you see, today you can, you can do jobs and you, without the land, right? Not every, in fact, very few jobs are agriculture related today. All right, you've got the internet, you've got ways of communicating, you know, you can do your work at home, some of you, right? But in that day, there was only agriculture. That was the only means of production. No land means no housing, no employment, no food. Everything that we need to survive, they don't have. What Moses is saying is, God, I don't want a house that's mortgage-free. God, I don't want a stable job. Unless you are here with me. I would rather not have these things. I would rather have you with me. This is what he's saying. This is the modern equivalent. God, it would be a disaster, in fact, to have both housing and employment, but not to have you in the picture. Are you hearing this? That's what Moses... This is the, the, the heart of Moses' prayer. God, the presence of God is so important to him. Everything else would be a disaster if not, if God is not in the picture. The Lord says to Moses, verse 17, This very thing you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. I know you by name. Some of you don't have a personal relationship with God, but God knows you by name. This is not some faraway God who doesn't care about the earth and lets it run on its own. God is a God of specifics. He knows you. He knows you by name. It's not by chance that you're here today, even if you're joining us online or in person. It's not by chance. God is working His will out. He knows you by name. That's the good news. And although, although here we see something really odd happening, it's a mystery. God's changing His mind, right? We saw what God said in verse 3, and here God says, this very thing you have spoken, I will do. Meaning to say, God will accompany Israel into the promised land. You want this? I will go with you. God's presence will accompany that presence which was interrupted by the corruption of sin within. Through the intercession of Moses, through the repentance of Israel, that presence will resume. We can't take it for granted that after sin, God's presence will resume. In fact, it's very scary for a person who holds sin to come into the presence of God. Most people who have sin, people who have sin come into the presence of God die. They worry about coming into the presence of God. It resumes, but it resumes, and it resumes because of God's grace. Alongside judgment for sin, there is grace for the repentant. It's not only grace. It's not 
only judgment, thanks be to God, because if it were only judgment, none of us could stand. God could have erased Israel. He could have just wiped them out, continued the covenant in Moses alone. Actually, that's what, that's what uh, initially he had said to Moses, but God did not. What happened? What happened? Grace happened. The grace of God happened. And as someone steps into the gap to plead for others, as Moses steps into the gap to plead for Israel, God demonstrates His grace. Some people say, you know, in the Old Testament there's only judgment, in the New Testament there's only grace. It's not true. There's both judgment and grace in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, when you get to the end of the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament, there is a massive judgment, the great white throne judgment, where all of humanity will be called to stand before God and to give an account of what they have done. Massive judgment. But here in the Old Testament, not only is there judgment, there is grace. Abundant grace. We often focus on the things that the, the Old Testament narrates, all right? And we think it's full of judgment. But you also have to look at the things that ought to have happened, that weren't narrated, they ought to have happened. Israel ought to have died. Adam and Eve ought to have died the moment they sinned. You have to look at the things that ought to have happened, but did not happen. And therein you find the grace of God. There in the midst of a simple declaration by God, here you can find abundant grace. Grace that is enough not just for Moses. Grace that is enough for a nation that's upwards of a million strong. There's enough grace. And if this was not enough in, in terms of intercession, Moses is, I must say, Moses is doing a really good job as an intercessor. You know, like, like if you want to learn how to pray, I think study the prayers of Moses, right? But if this was not enough, Moses asks for the impossible. He wants to experience God's glory. He wants to experience God's presence, all of it. God permits this request. This is the other thing that astounds me as I'm going through this passage. God actually permits this request, but with some modifications. He tells Moses, if you look at my face, you will die. So what I'll do, cover, you will be in the cleft of a rock, I will cover the rock, and as I pass by, when I pass by, I will lift my hand, you will see my back, so that you will not die. He will experience the glorious presence of God, but he will live. And God makes that way. In his grace, he makes that way so that Moses experiences his glory, but does not die. Some of you might, might be wondering, like, what's the connection? How, how does Moses get from interceding for Israel to show me your glory. It's, it's, it's a bit of a jump, right? What is it Moses actually asking for? Show me your glory is a very cryptic request. You know, it's like so much can be meant by that short phrase. And because I think it's so cryptic, Scripture also, through the answer of God, helps us to answer or helps us to understand the question. So let's first look at God's response. God says, I will make my goodness pass before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You see, God actually knows the actual question that is on Moses' heart. The actual question is, God, who are you really? Who exactly are you? What's, what's your character like? I really need to know you. I'm worried. M Moses would probably say, it's not in the text, but he'd probably say, I'm worried because of what has happened. What if we as a nation sin again? Are we always one short step from being wiped out completely? I need to know who you are exactly, O oh God. Show me who you are. And the beautiful thing about this passage is that God answers in two specific ways. There is the message. God speaks to Moses in a way in, so that Moses hears in no uncertain terms that his essential nature is goodness. 
His essential nature is grace. His essential nature is mercy. These characteristics are part of who God is. When Moses is asking God, show me your glory, he wants to know who God exactly is, and God is telling him, in a way that he can understand, this is who God says he is. That's the message. But there's also the means. He's communicating through the means. Moses is immediately engulfed in the manifest presence of God. And Moses does not die, but yet lives and experiences the glory of God. So this knowledge of God as good, as gracious, as merciful, is not merely head knowledge for him. He now has a lived experience that lines up with what he knows in his mind of God's goodness, of God's grace, of God's mercy. Through the message and through the means, God demonstrates his character. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. No way for Moses to experience. No, God will make a way. What is true rest then? As we are coming to the end of this passage, what is true rest? I would say first and foremost, true rest is positional. What do I mean by that? It's not a venue. True rest is not the promised land. True rest is being in the presence of God. The position is not that of the promised land. That's not true rest. Yes, you might have employment. Yes, you might have housing, but that's not true rest. True rest is being in the presence of God. And as long as God is with us, we can find true rest. Some of us are going through financial hardships. Some of us have mortgages to pay. Interest rates are really high. Some of us are experiencing instability in our jobs and our vocational life. Some of us are, are, are finding it hard even to find jobs, right? But let me tell you, true rest is not there. It's helpful, right? It's helpful. I won't say it's not important. It's helpful, but it's not that. True rest is being found in the presence of God. It is positional. True rest is also directional. It's not merely resting away from activity. It's not merely kind of trying to do nothing for one entire Sabbath day, you know, as if a resting from activity is true Sabbath, right? L trying to lie in bed for, for 24 hours is really hard. I don't know if you've done it before, but for me, it's really hard, <laughs> right? But it's a resting towards God. It's directional. It's not away from activity. It's towards God. Just as Moses has found out, true rest comes from knowing the character of God. I believe many of us have questions here, just like Moses. Questions that we are afraid of asking God. God, who are you truly? For real, who are you? In the midst of my storm, who are you? In the midst of my suffering, who are you? When I'm going through a difficult time, where are you? I'm sure we have many questions and some of us are afraid to ask God the difficult questions. What if God is not good? What if God is not merciful? What if He's not gracious? What if He counts all of our sins and our transgressions against us? Who could stand before Him? No one could continue to exist. But God, I want to tell you the good news. The good news is that God prepares a way God prepares a way for us to remain in relationship with Him. Even if we have disappointed Him, even if we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even if we have done things that have broken our relationship with Him and broken our relationship with one another, God prepares a way. In the Old Testament, there is the covenant that God um, uh, 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 calls Israel into. And through the covenant, He provides a sacrifice, a way out for Israel so that even though they sin, they can be made right with God. The sacrifice of a lamb, the sacrifice of a burnt offering. In the New Covenant, in the New Testament, we who know Jesus, we who know Christ, have in Him a sacrifice that makes right our relationship with God. The message given by Jesus in the New Testament, the message given by Jesus is clear. 
God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. That's the message. But then there's also the means. It's not just words. He lays down His life on the cross for you and I. He lives the perfect life you and I ought to have lived. He dies the death that you and I ought to have died. On the cross, He pays for our sin. In substitution, He stands on our behalf before God so that in Him we might be made right with God. That is the good news. In Jesus Christ, there is the message and the means, and both of this speak of God making a way so that His presence can dwell with us. True rest comes from receiving this knowledge, this re- revelation of Jesus Christ as Son of God. I'll invite you to stand this morning or this afternoon as the worship team just comes forward to prepare to, to lead us in a, a response song. Let's prepare our hearts to respond to God, the revelation of His true rest. you to remain standing as I speak the benediction over you. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace that you might experience true rest, a renewed relationship with God and a revitalization of relationships with those God has placed around you. Blessings are pronounced this day in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to sit for a moment as we take some time to meditate on the Word of God before we go from here.